Well, we have a treat this morning for Equipping Hour. Joel James is no stranger to this ministry. Uh, You have read his materials or you have benefited from those who have. Uh, If you've worked through his hermeneutics material, you've done homework for Joel already. Uh, Joel's uh, a pastor and missionary uh, for many years. How many years in South Africa? Like 87 or something? 28? Okay, 28 years in South Africa, sent out a grace community in L.A., and Uh, So we're thankful to have him. He told me, don't introduce me for very long because I have lots of very convicting things to say, and the more you talk, the less I get to. So Joel, come on up and teach us. Okay, well, welcome this morning. It's good to have you with, I probably just turned it off rather than turning it on. Somebody told me, okay, there I am. Good. Um, It is a pleasure to be here. Scott Maxwell and I go back, as some of you know, all the way to to university, and uh, we've had Smed over in South Africa to teach at our pastor's conference, and so we have uh, uh, lots of great connections with this church, and it is really a pleasure to be here and to serve you. Well, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 this morning. Smed said I should do something on... on, uh, kind of just godly living or biblical counseling or something like that. And so I've picked what is probably one of my worst sermons in the sense of most painful um, because I need it regularly, and uh, I think you will benefit from it as well. Um, I've called this, as you may have seen, um, if you saw the uh, some, some explanation of what we're going to do this morning, um, the most dangerous sin you've never heard a sermon about. Uh, That's what we're going to talk about this morning, the most dangerous sin that you have never heard a sermon about. And it is what I call the sin of comparing, the sin of comparing. It's a deadly sin. It's a sin that is rarely acknowledged, that we rarely see. We don't see the significance of it. We experience all the calamitous side effects and consequences of it, but we're often, often unwittingly experiencing those. The key text in all the scripture on the sin of comparing is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 4. And so that will be our home base text, and we'll be going a lot of other places as well. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 4. Solomon says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. Now, Solomon uses the word rivalry there, or whatever your version, however, describes it. Rivalry is a compelling urge to equal or surpass someone else, Uh, a compelling urge to equal or surpass other people. And it, in fact, that rivalry idea is what lies behind the sin of comparing. Solomon does two things here in this verse. He asserts both the universality of this sin, it's universal, it's everybody, and he talks about the severity of it and its consequences. And so let's start with that. We'll start with those two words as a kind of an outline. We'll add some things as we go along. The universality and the severity of the sin of comparing. Very few people have given much thought to this sin, but I think it's one of the most subtle and most destructive sins that a believer in Jesus Christ can succumb to. And we ask the question, well, is this really that big a deal? Is it as pervasive as you're saying? Is this an underlying issue in so many of our sin struggles? And the answer from Solomon is yes, it is. Uh, Yes, it is. He says in verse 4, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is a result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. In fact, unless you have consciously restrained yourself this morning as you came into church, you've probably already participated in this sin at some level or another. Sunday church service are often a playground of the sin of comparing. An author named David Paulson writes this, quote, Perhaps on walking into the fellowship hall at church, a woman is instantly aware of what every other woman is wearing and has sized up how she compares. Her gaze at other people is conditioned to a status hierarchy defined by images of beauty and thus to the attendant jealousy and self-loathing and competitiveness and inferiority, superiority comparisons and the like. 
He says, all such preoccupations rob her of the joy and the freedom of faith in Jesus Christ. And they sap energies that might be spent on loving concern for others, unquote. Now, unfortunately, Paulson is all too right, and I'll get to the men in a moment, but starting with the women, Christian women resentlessly, com relentlessly compete in their minds in a perpetual informal Olympic Games, comparing the behavior of their children, the orderliness of their homes, the smoothness of their complexion, the stylishness of their hair. But of course, men are equally guilty of this sin equally susceptible to fall into the sin of comparing. Men like to compare things like cars and ties and biceps and salaries, spiritual gifts and success of various kinds. We've all seen leadership meetings in which two men act like two bull elephants pushing and shoving to see whose ego is the bi biggest, who, who, who's going to run the room. Right? Pastors, of course, play the game too. In fact, pastors are sometimes the worst at this. They compare sermons and websites and budgets and congregation sizes. I've already counted the number of chairs in here to see if it's more than in my church. It is. Oh, yeah. In fact, Solomon's observation is that the pursuit of excellence in our world is often more accurately a pursuit of excelling others than the pursuit of excellence. Comparing is a pervasive sin. Solomon is not exaggerating when he says, I've seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and another. This is a pervasive sin. You say, okay, well, it's everywhere. I can kind of see that now, but is it destructive? Is it as bad as you're saying it is, Joel? And here the answer is a decided yes as well. You see, when you, compare, when you play the comparing game, you either win or lose. Solomon focuses on the one here in verse 4. I've seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. It's pervasive. It's universal. This, too, is vanity and striving after the wind. This is emptiness. This is futile. This, this leaves me feeling meaningless and frustrated. He, he focuses on the losing aspect. There's also a winning aspect in a sense, right? When you play the comparing game, you either win or lose, right, in your own mind. When you appear to win, the result is a sense of smug superiority. Bask in my glory, you second-rate excuse for a preacher, a, a mother, a businessman, whatever it is. On the other hand, when you believe you've lost the comparing game, the result is a disabling sense of defeat and despondency. My children will never be as good as Susie's innocent band of angels, you know. <clears throat> Some people, oddly enough, even seem to enjoy losing more than they enjoy winning the comparing game. They seem to relish the self-pity, the enthusiastically continually beating themselves up for coming seconds. They, they almost seem to relish that and prefer that. The reality is both of those responses. The self-congratulating conceit of the supposed winner and the deflated despondency and defeatism of the supposed loser, they are deadly and destructive to spiritual life. They are a Christless, sinless self-focus. And the plain truth is that self-focus is never a noble, honorable state for a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, as believers, we are as susceptible to this sin and the allurement of sinful comparing as anyone else. And, of course, what we do here on Sundays can often be tainted by the rivalry and mental comparing contests, as I have mentioned. Hebrews 10, verse 22 says that we are to draw near to God with a sincere heart, with an unmixed heart. And there is inevitably a noble, spirit-transformed part of us in Christ that, that is genuinely sincere. Well, let's acknowledge that. If we love God. We love Christ. We love the church. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's real and that's genuine. And it is, it is not feigned. It is not faked. It's the work of the Spirit of God in us. However, it's true as well, isn't it, that often at the very same time, coexisting as it were in the same place, 
there is a darker, slimier part of our hearts in which lurks jealousy and selfish ambition, as James 3 calls it. Isn't it true that, shockingly, we can be both sincere and insincere at the same time? We don't mind sharing some of the glory with Christ, but there's a part of us that cries out for our percentage, for our cut of the reputation deal, for a little bit of the credits. You know, for example, I'm a little bit of a freak when it comes to writing my sermons, and so, so I work on it in detail, and, and so I always have to sit back and ask myself, okay, now, Joel, why are you working so hard to craft your sermons, right? Is it because I want to glorify God, because I want to do what I do with excellence as far as I'm able, because I want to help you, God's people, to grow in love and obedience? And the answer to those questions is, well, yes, it is that. Or I have to ask, is it because I want to be known as a better preacher than the guy down the street? And sometimes I have to admit that in my fleshly moments, that might be true too. The majority of the time, I can assure you, otherwise I would have to just leave the pulpit right now, I can assure you that it is for God's glory and for your good. I do this from a heart that is genuine with a love for Christ and a love for you and a love for God's word. But how easy it is in my fleshly moments to to slip into the sewer of comparing and go for a little swim. And when I do, I come out dripping with either the smug arrogance of perceived superiority and success or the discouraged despondency of a perceived inferiority. That's why Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, watch over your heart, your moment by moment, minute by minute thinking. That's how I define heart, uh, or at least describe it. Uh, Watch over your minute by minute thinking with all diligence. Well, for a lot of reasons, one is you might slip into the comparing game and not even realize it. That's why Proverbs 4, verse 25 says, let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Comparing, looking at others, looking left and right, right, is a spiritual habit. It's a sin that we don't even know is a sin in many cases. It's the most dangerous sin you've never heard a sermon about. Comparing is a spiritually habit. It's so subtle, it's so easy, it's so familiar, and it's so deadly. Again, Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 4.4, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done, universality, is a result of rivalry, of comparing between a man and his neighbor, This too, here's where it leads. It leads to vanity, striving after wind, emptiness, frustration, and meaninglessness. Now, having seen the universality of it and having seen the the, the danger of it, let's think for a moment of some biblical examples. What would this look like as we turn the pages of Scripture? Let's... Think of some biblical examples of the sin of comparing in action. And, and, you know, if I gave you five minutes, you could come up with a dozen very easily, and so these will be, uh, these will be familiar. Right? Biblical examples of the sin of comparing and its destructive results. So chronologically, the very first person to engage in sinful comparing was Lucifer the archangel. Right? He, he compared himself to God, longed to be first, and demolished the universe as a result. Cain compared himself and his snub sacrifice with Abel and Abel's sacrifice, and as a result, tumbled into sibling rivalry, including anger, depression, and eventually murder. Hagar became pregnant when Sarah couldn't and despised Sarah for it. And Sarah, of course, returned the favor. She returned the rivalry, bitterly mistreating Hagar. Rachel and Leah, how could we forget those two, partook in a sisterly child-bearing contest that made both of them bitter and miserable. When Joseph's brothers saw that dad favored Joseph over them, their comparing led to a hatred and to a near murder that was downgraded to kidnapping and slavery by only the narrowest of margins. In Numbers 12, Miriam and Aaron compared themselves to their more illustrious brother Moses and and resented it because they were coming second and third in the reputation contest with Moses. 
Has indeed Yahweh spoken only through Moses, they said? Has he not spoken through us as well, they complained? Comparing led them to undercut Moses' leadership and led God to afflict Miriam with leprosy. That scenario, of course, was repeated in Numbers chapter 16 with Korah and company. They compared their status to Moses' leadership and a fiery rivalry erupted like a volcano. You've gone far enough, they said to Moses, for all of the congregation are holy. Can I just give you a little secret? They weren't worried about the congregation, just so you know that. All of the congregation are holy. They were worried about themselves. So why do you exalt yourselves over the assembly of Yahweh? Of course, it was God that exalted Moses, not Moses. And you might remember the terminal destination of their sin of comparing. With Miriam, it was leprosy. With these guys, you remember, the ground opened up and swallowed them alive and closed back over them. Maybe this is an important sin. Maybe it is serious. King Saul played the comparing game for most of his life, actually, and always perceived himself as the loser to David. Saul compared his supposedly paltry successes with the spectacular, they were spectacular achievements of his subordinate, David. And the result, you remember, was jealousy, suspicion, fear, unjust emotion, fits of rage, and even attempted murder. In Psalm 73, you meet a man named Asaph, an otherwise mature and godly man who compared his meager financial lifestyle to the wealthy wicked of Israel and nearly fell off the spiritual map as a result. The disciples played the comparing game in the New Testament. Like an all-comers tackle football match, heedless of the spiritual bloodletting that was sure to result, they compared Luke 9. Verse 46, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest, which is kind of a foolish thing since God the Son is in the group. Another world champion in the comparing game was the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. He chose as his opponent a man whom he believed he could easily defeat, whom he could easily rout, the morally inferior tax gatherer. And the Pharisee's victory in the comparing game swelled his chest like an exotic bird performing a ritual mating display. He danced and he preened and he paraded and he crowed, I am not like other people, the sin of comparing with a capital C. You see, whether it's the smug superiority of the perceived victory or the discouraged feelings of meaninglessness that Solomon points out in Ecclesiastes 4.4. Sin of comparing and its self-focus is a devastating sin. It's familiar, it's subtle, it's destructive, and it's deadly. It's the worst sin you are now hearing your first sermon about. (laughs) Now, I would suggest to you that the sin of comparing typically falls into two broad categories. Uh, Let me give you them and I'll illustrate So two broad categories are we compare success in all different settings of life. We tend to compare success and we compare situations. By that, I don't mean our situation compared to other people's situation, but our situation now with our situation either in the past or what we hope our situation will be in the present. Let me walk you through both. The success category is pretty easy to see. The comparing of success, that's pretty easy to see. Christians easily fall into the ugly habit of comparing monetary, moral, ministry, and maternal success. We easily fall into those sinful habits. You pick a target, you pick a rival, you pick an opponent, and you subtly compare your success to, to his or hers, and then either celebrate or lament, depending on whether you believe you won or lost the game. You might call this kind of comparing the sin of reputation, um, the sin of reputation thinking. We lust for reputation. We lust for the reputation of success inside whatever circle of endeavor we are pursuing. Uh, Some circles of success we care nothing about, right? But there are circles we do care about. 
Now, as I said, the second category in which we struggle with comparing is the comparing of situation. And I mean, my situation with somebody else's, that's the success scenario. This is comparing where I'm at now, how my life is going now, with what I had in the past or what I perceive I will have in the future. Let me illustrate this from Ecclesiastes. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 7.10 is a very powerful verse for all elderly people or anyone who's tempted to live in the past in any way by comparing the good old days with the present. Ecclesiastes 7.10, do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? You see the comparing? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. That, that comparing thing between past life situation and present life situation, I mean, you're aware that there are differences, but that relentless comparing game, Solomon says, not helping you. It's not, it's not helping you. It is not wise. It's foolish. Comparing your present situation to the golden memories of the past is not wise. You can think about the past joyfully and thankfully and so on, but, but the comparing game, no, it needs to stop before it gets to that. What does it lead to? It leads to frustration and discouragement and discontentment. Why can't my life be like it was five years ago, 10 years ago, or 50 years ago? If you need a big biblical illustration, think of the Israelites in Numbers 11, longing for the leeks and the onions and the garlic of Egypt. And remember the, their slavery days in Egypt. Rather than being thankful for their national deliverance by God, rather than being intent on and thankful for God's provision of manna and so on, rather than focusing on the blessings that they had right now, they're whining about the fact they don't have what they had in the past. The sin of comparing present situation with the past. Now, Ecclesiastes also talks about comparing the future meaning your earthly future, you're supposed to think about heaven, right? But your earthly future, what you hope to have in the future with your present. Uh, the comparing can go backwards, the pairing, com comparing can go forwards. Look at chapter 6, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 6, verse 9. What the eye sees is better than what the soul desires. This, too, is futility and striving after wind. I had a roommate in college who used to say to me, this was, he said it like 20 times a week, oh, I can't wait for, and it was always next week or three weeks or whatever. And there's a sense of anticipation that's fine. But I pointed out to him once, I'm not sure you're enjoying today because you're so worried about next week. Are you enjoying today? He was a new believer. He just never really thought about that. And that's the idea that Solomon is Playing, laying in front of us here. What the eye sees, what you have now, what God has given you now in the gifts that you have in life, right? what you have now is better than what you desire, better than what you hope you might have next week. Be content, be thankful in what you have right now rather than comparing to your past situation or your perceived or your hoped for future, be thankful now. So we can play the comparing game in regard to success as we compare it to what others have or as we compare it in situation to what we ourselves have had in either the past or hope to have in the future. So comparing leads this sin described in Ecclesiastes 4.4. It leads either to a smug pride or to a discouraged kind of rivalry, jealousy, bitterness, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, to a destructive, unnecessary competitiveness. The sin of comparing causes pastors to change their doctrine and to abandon their biblical philosophy of ministry because somebody else's church down the street is growing faster than theirs. They know what is true. They know what the Bible says, but because they're playing the comparing game, they're going to jettison their biblical philosophy of ministry. That's a disaster. It causes seminaries to court the approval of theological liberals to boast and bolster their academic reputations. We're worried about what other people think. We're playing the comparing game. If they don't think we're academic enough, well, we better let a little liberalism in here so that they'll think highly of us. The comparing game causes women to push the lines of modesty and to wallow in self-punishing pity parties. It leads men to take performance-enhancing drugs and to destroy leadership situations with a competitive, self-serving, self-advancing agendas. Comparing destroys. 
It destroys churches, it destroys marriages, it destroys families, it destroys hearts. And God does not intend that you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, that we live in the sewer of the sin of comparing. But it's so much a part of us, it's, it, you know, it's, it's like breathing air. You just don't see it. You don't think about it. Right? It's like living in Los Angeles. And, you know, there, you, you think eventually that air is supposed to be brown and that you can spread it on bread, you know? Um, and then you go somewhere else and realize you're not supposed to be able to see air, you know? Um, you just don't even see it after a while. That's how the sin of comparing is. So, having beat you up on what the sin of comparing is, its seriousness, its universality, and some examples of it, now let's look at solutions. Now let's look at solutions. It was never enough to just do the put off. We need to do the put on, right? What are the solutions to the sin of comparing? And I, I'm going to give you nine solutions. Right? Nine solutions. Okay. Nine solutions, and I think we'll be able to get through all of these. There's a reason I'm talking fast. Number one, I like to talk fast when I preach, but, but I'm also trying to get through this. Nine solutions to the often overlooked but very, very deadly sin of comparing. Number one, solution number one to this sin is work for Christ's reputation, not yours. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, and here's where we have to just kind of run all over the scripture to see solutions in different places. Colossians chapter 3. Work for Christ's reputation, not your own. Since the sin of reputation seeking, since the sin of reputation treasuring, is a major piece of the comparing puzzle, then to combat it, you're going to have to work consciously for Christ's reputation rather than yours. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do, whatever you do, that's whoever you are and whatever you're doing as a Christian, and we do different things. We have different gifts, different life responsibilities. This room represents a hundred of them. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, that's not a shocking kind of principle, something you never even thought of, because the, the reality is we would all like to say, I do what I do to the glory of God. I, I do what I do because I want to glorify my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We all say that, and I think we genuinely mean it sometimes, uh, and I think we maybe genuinely mean it most of the time, and sometimes we don't. We all say that we're working to exalt Christ, to glorify Christ. No, no Christian would come up to you, no biblically taught Christian, come up to you and say, it's all about me, and Jesus, he's, he's in second place. Right? But the sad reality, and you know this battle as much as I do, the sad reality is it's quite possible to intermingle genuine Christ-exalting motives with genuinely self-promoting motives. It is sadly possible to stand here on Sunday morning and sing together the great songs that we sing and genuinely be exalting Christ with one part of your mind and hoping the person in front of you is recognizing what a fine voice you have at the same time. It's just horrible to realize how easy it is to have mixed motives, to, to, to be intermingle those things. And so when we talk about, I want to do what I do to the glory of Christ, don't change that. That's fantastic. That's great. Just be suspicious of your motives from time to time. Be suspicious of your motives. Not in some kind of panicky search for evil that isn't there, but, but you know your heart. And if it's obvious, then we're going to have to stick a knife in this. Right? We're going to have to kill it. We are more concerned about our reputations than we like to admit and furthermore, if you've had some level of success in whatever you do, maybe it's as a mother, it might be as a preacher or a pastor, it could be anything, businessman, if you have some level of success in what you do, the people around you will often unwittingly, trying to encourage genuinely, but they will often unwittingly encourage an ungodly preoccupation with reputation by some form of hero worship. Pastors have to deal with this all the time. We have to deal with the reality that some people will put us up on a pedestal that we simply don't deserve. I tell my congregation all the time, I'm just another member of this church. I love being a part of this church. I happen to be gifted in certain ways in teaching and leadership as some, some of the other men here. I, I'm gifted in certain ways that allow me, by God's grace, to be up here and do a lot of the teaching and that sort of thing. But the reality is hero worship is just not on. 
Do you remember when Moses had to address that? Moses had to reprove Joshua's attempt to defend Moses' reputation as the prophet in Israel. In Numbers 11, you remember that there were some other men who began prophesying, and Moses chided Joshua for Joshua's panic about that. Are you jealous for my sake, said Moses to Joshua? Joshua's hero worshiping wasn't helping Moses respond better in a humble and gracious way. And it wasn't helping Joshua either. Hero worship is not bad, or sorry, is bad for both the worshiper and the one being worshiped. It's just bad for everybody. And Joshua perceived that there was some threat to Moses' exalted reputation in Israel. And Moses is like, you're not helping me here, Joshua. Are you jealous for my sake? Just stop playing the comparing game. And so whether it's in your family, whether it's in your workplace, your ministry, whatever it is, do what you do genuinely to advance the reputation of Christ, not your own. We say that, good. Keep saying that, just make sure how much, check how much you actually mean it when you say it. Colossians 3, verse 17, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. For those in ministry, Paul's powerful reminder in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5 was, we do not preach ourselves. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Someone has observed, there is no limit to what a man can accomplish if he doesn't care who gets the credit for it. Now, actually, in our case, we do care. We want Jesus to have the credit for it. We care very much who gets the credit for whatever our success is, whether it's in family or ministry or business or wherever it is. Right? We care very much that Jesus gets the credit for it. And therefore, we don't worry if we get any or not. We're doing it to the glory of Jesus Christ. When you work for Christ's reputation, and that's generally your heart, and you're, you're checking your heart and your mixed motives and unmixing them, right? then you happily disregard what others might be preoccupied with, your reputation, what your flesh might be preoccupied with. You happily disregard that, and you know what? The noxious weed of comparing starts to wither. That's solution number one. Do what you do for the glory of Christ, but check your mixed motives. Number two, solution number two is gladly acknowledge that success is God's gift. Success, both your success and your quote-unquote rival success, success is a gift from the hand of God, both for you and for others as well. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Whether it's parenting, whether it's business accomplishments, whether it's ministry, whatever it is, both your success and that of others is a gift from God, and you need to gladly acknowledge that, and that will damp down the fires of comparing. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 7. For when one says, I am a Paul, hero worship, right? If Paul and Apollos won't fight, we'll fight for them, right? One says, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? You're acting like you don't even have the Spirit of God, says Paul. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants. Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. My success, says Paul, was a gift from God. Apollos' success was a gift from God. Can we just focus on God? I planted Paul's water, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. When you gladly acknowledge that God is the sovereign source of success in whatever realm, this is ministry, but it could be any realm. When you gladly acknowledge that God is the sovereign source of success, that, that just calms down the rages, fire, raging fires of the sin of comparing. You remember when John the Baptist's followers were panicking because Jesus' ministry was eclipsing John's? 
John reminded them a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him by heaven. It's a gift from God, and so don't worry. If Jesus' ministry is being blessed more than mine, says John the Baptist, it's a gift from God. We're just not going to play the comparing game. John's genuine trusting confidence in God's sovereignty and wisdom silenced the barking dog of his comparing heart. Solution number three. Remember that Christianity is a race, but not a competition. Christianity is a race, Paul uses that illustration frequently, but it's not a competition. Paul often compares Christian life to a race. However, neither you nor I are in a competition with other Christians. For example, uh, I'm not in a race with some famous preacher like John MacArthur or Smedley. You know, I'm, 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 just not in, I'm just not in a competition with those guys. I'm not in a race with my pastor friends in South Africa. I run in my lane. They run in their lane. They are God-assigned lanes, right? And I run in my lane with my gifts and my strengths and, quite frankly, with my limps and my deficiencies as well. I'm just not in a competition with them. It's a race and I'm running, but it's not a competition. That brings a lot of relief to ministry and to life. I don't have to compare. I don't have to contend. I don't have to vie or compete. In other realms, I'm a very competitive person. I like sports, and I like to play hard. I'm competitive in that sense, but that has to be left at the side right? when I walk off the sports field. That was about 20 years ago right? when I did that. But... It's not about a comparing game anymore. I do what I do because God has gifted me in a certain way, and I'm content with the level of blessing that he has chosen to dispense. Now, I always want to strive for excellence. I always want to strive for excellence. That's a beneficial competition with myself, as it were, not with others. So there's nothing wrong with pushing yourself and being competitive in that sense, But if another gets more acclaim, gets a higher post, has a bigger church, whatever it is, I was never in a race with him anyway. And that's a great way to cool the bubbling pot of a comparing heart. Remember that Christianity is a race, but it's not a competition. The parable of the talents helps us remember that. The parable of the talents, Matthew 25. The slave who was given two talents was not in a com competition with the one who was given five. Both received exactly the same approving affirmation from the Lord, well done, good and faithful slave. Matthew 10, verse 42, assures you that a cup of cold water given to a thirsty child in the crush this morning We'll be rewarded by God just as much as the preacher is rewarded for opening and proclaiming the word of God. We have this bizarre idea that, that one is more significant in guys, God's eyes than the other. And they play different roles, but God looks at it and says, you know what? Both of those are rewarded the same. It's just not a competition. It's not a competition. Now, let's turn to a fourth solution to the sin of comparing. And to see that one, turn with me to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Earlier, I listed out a, a series of negative examples of the sin of comparing. And now let me give you a positive example of someone who avoided the comparing game. And that someone is the Apostle Paul. John the Baptist in John 3 avoids the comparing game very well. Paul does it here in Philippians chapter 1. He doesn't fall into the comparing trap, although there's some guys trying to push him into it. Philippians chapter 1. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippian church while he was under house arrest in Rome at the end of the book of Acts, and he notes that his two-year imprisonment in Rome had been used by God in unexpected ways to advance the cause of the gospel in that city. Well, you know, we, we can understand that. He picks up in verse 15 with this. Talking about other preachers in the city of Rome. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. They're living in Ecclesiastes 4.4. They're doing what they do out of rivalry and comparing. 
Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. There were some good guys, too. The latter, the bad, or sorry, the good guys, they do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Uh, they're just not comparing themselves with Paul. The former, the bad guys, the selfishly ambitious, they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What a terrible reason, motive for preaching the gospel. What then, says Paul? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. You see it? The fourth solution to the sin of comparing is to refuse to be drawn into the game. When someone else is playing, refuse to be drawn into the game. Refuse to be drawn into the fray and into the battle of egos. Paul took the counsel of Solomon in Proverbs chapter 4. He looked neither to the left or to the right. I mean, he knew what those guys were doing. And he could see what the motives of some of them were, right? But Paul says, those guys might be in a race, but I'm not in a race with them. He refused to be drawn in. He refused to compare. He refused to compete. In fact, what Paul did, though he could see what was happening, and you can tell he didn't think highly of it, but what Paul did was he thanked God that at least some good was coming out of those preachers' ministries, even if their motives seemed to be sullied and soiled. Right? And so refused to be drawn into the game. And that's number four. Solution number five. Solution number five to the sin of comparing is be glad for the good that God gives through the success of others. And so earlier I said we need to acknowledge that success is a gift from the hand of God. This goes the next step further. I'm not merely acknowledging that. Now I'm thankful for my quote-unquote rival's success. The fact that her children are more obedient than my children. And the fact that his church is bigger than my church, or whatever it is. Be glad for the good that God gives through the success of others. And Paul illustrates that here in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. In this I rejoice. Paul is glad that the gospel is being preached and that people are coming to Christ at that level of success, right? He would love for them to clean up their motives, but the fact that God is giving some level of success, he, he's happy. He's very happy. Moses did exactly the same thing in Numbers 11 in that incident I mentioned earlier with the prophesying thing. You remember when Eldad and Medad, the two, two prominent men in Israel, when they prophesied in the camp... First of all, some tail-bearing trouble-causer, there's always one, isn't there, right, ran and reported, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Moses, what are we going to do because you're not getting all the glory and all this, right? There's always somebody, right? First, some tail-bearing trouble-causer comes and reports what they're doing. Then Joshua, in a fit of hero worship, leaps in to defend Moses' reputation. But just like the Apostle Paul here, Moses refuses to be drawn into the fray. Moreover, more than that, he consciously focused on the good that Eldad and Medad were providing for God's people, just like Paul did here. He's not focused on some kind of loss of status that he, Moses, might suffer if somebody else starts getting divine revelation as well. Are you jealous for my sake, he asks? I wish that all of Yahweh's people were prophets. Wouldn't it be great, says Moses to Joshua, if many godly men were receiving true, infallible, inerrant, divine revelation directly from the mouth and the mind of God? Wouldn't that be fantastic? How would Israel be benefited if that were true? Like Paul, Moses refused to be drawn into the reputation contest, and more than that, he stilled any fleshly lusts in his own heart he refused to defend his unique reputation and he rejoiced in the good that the success of others, the gifting by God of others, that that was bringing to God's people. Uh, that's kind of the full picture, isn't it? God's in charge of this. We're not gonna fight about it and I'm just glad that God is bringing good. 
A love for your neighbor and the good of the benefit of Susie's sinless band of angels, the good of the benefit of somebody else's ministry that's bigger than yours or whatever illustration would suit your life situation. The good of that, the love for your neighbor, thankfulness that God is giving good and blessing others, helps quell the inner proddings to maintain a unique and unparalleled reputation. I'm not going to be drawn into the battle. In fact, I'm going to be grateful and thankful for the good that God has given. Number six. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I've mentioned John the Baptist uh, and his heroic way of handling things. Uh, Let me go a step further and take you to that text and, and... show you something more specific now. A sixth solution to the sin of comparing. You've seen the noble example of Paul. I've been illustrating from Moses, right? And, well, let's think about John. John 3, verse 26, I've already mentioned this. And they came to John, that's John's uh, followers, his disciples, and they said to him, and you just have to read this in a whiny voice, there's no other way to do it, Rabbi, He who was with you beyond the Jordan to to whom you have testified. Oh, by the way, you know, he's got his ministry only because you testified about him. He owes everything to you, John, right? Right? That this one whom you have testified to, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. You can just hear the, the Ecclesiastes 4 vanity and frustration and whining, right? Clearly, John's disciples have fallen into the deep end of the swimming pool of the sin of comparing, right? Up to this point, John's ministry had indeed been ministry number one in Judea. There's no question of that. He had the biggest numbers. He had the most influence, the most radical reputation. He had it all. And John's followers struggled to swallow the reality that John's ministry was being eclipsed by Jesus' ministry. Verse 27. Jesus, or sorry, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. That's the confidence in God's sovereignty that we already talked about. Now, verse 28. You yourselves are my witnesses. I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of... Do you remember, guys? I already told you in so many words that, that this one is going to excel me. I've already said I was in the second place and he was in first place. You, you should remember that. Uh, that. That's a rebuke. You yourself are witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, verse 28, and I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. That's Jesus. That's the Messiah. I'm just here for decoration. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly, not just teeth grindingly accepting the success of another, but rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. And then the classic line, he must increase, but I must decrease. And guys, it's okay. It's okay. What made John, John great? The humility to embrace second place. Because that's what he's saying here. I was always going to be in second place, he says to his followers, and it's okay. He must increase, I must decrease. We're just glad that the Messiah has come. Can we just be thankful for that, right? That the truth is being heard. That's solution number six to the sin of comparing. Have the humility to gladly embrace second place. Not reluctantly, not teeth grindingly, not bitterly, not resentfully, but to gladly accept second place. First Peter 5, verse 5, Peter said, you younger men clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And the reality is young and old, or old our hearts are tempted to lust for first place. We're, we're taught from the earliest of days, right, whether it's sports or anything else, right? You, you want to be in the first chair when you're playing violin. You, you want to be in the top step of the podium when you're running a race. Right? We're taught to long for and lust for the first place. First is first and second is last, as I used to say in my triathlon days. I got last a lot. I'll just let you know that. Right? <clears throat> 
We long for the top step of the podium where the applause is the loudest, where the acclaim is the most enthusiastic. Humility gladly takes the second step and maybe the third or the fourth or the fifth one if necessary. Humility kills the sin of comparing. We're not in a competition with other Christians. Number seven. Number seven. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 3. The seventh solution to the sin of comparing is found here in Romans 12, verse 3. In context of spiritual gifts, he says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Uh, you could turn it upside down and say, and you're not thinking, shouldn't be thinking more lowly of yourself than you ought to think either. It's not, it's not genuine humility to downplay whatever gifts God has given you either. I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has allotted, there's that sovereignty of God giving gifts again, and as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Seventh solution to the sin of comparing is employ sound judgment mixed with humility when you're evaluating yourself. Employ sound judgment mixed with humility when you're evaluating yourself in whatever realm of life you serve and minister. It's important that we accurately and humbly evaluate ourselves when we serve Christ rather than either exaggerating or minimizing what we do. For example, a preacher might come to me and say, oh, I'm a terrible preacher. My question is, is it true? Is it true? Is that a true and sound self-judgment? Are, are you the seminary student that I need to protect the church of Jesus Christ from and never allow you to get in a pulpit that I will benefit the body of Christ for decades to come if I keep you out of the pulpit, right? If you're that guy, then guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna keep you out of the pulpit, right? I'll try to train you, but if it's not going anywhere, we're, we're, we're gonna do a sound, sensible self-judgment here. Or is it when he comes to me and says, oh, I'm just a terrible preacher. Is that a self-serving exaggeration designed to elicit sympathy? Yes, normally. An exaggeration that allows him to wallow in a sticky, sweet misery of self-pity. Another pastor might say, oh, I just feel inferior when I hear famous conference speakers preach. I, I can't preach like that. Based on Romans 12, 3, Paul would say, well, are you inferior? Right? I mean, are they better preachers than you? And if they are, why does that bother you? Ouch. If the sound self-judgment that, you know, I'll just use John MacArthur. Right? John MacArthur is a better preacher than me. If that sound self-judgment is true, why does that bother me? Why am I not thanking God for his sovereign gift to that man and the benefit that I and so many others have, 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 have had because of that gift? And why am I not thanking God for it? Why? Because I'm a selfish, self-preoccupied sinner living in and dominated by the sin of comparing. That's why. The sin of comparing is defeated when we make sound, accurate evaluations of ourselves and have the humility then to accept them. Romans 12, 3 again. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. As far as we're able, accurate self-assessment. And we'll always need help with that from our friends. But accurate self-assessment as far as we're able because God has allotted to each a measure of faith. There are different levels of giftedness. We're good at different things at different levels, and that's okay. The Christian life and ministry is not a competition. We're, we're just not in a race with other Christians. The spirit of comparing is put to the sword to experience a well-deserved and much-needed death when you evaluate yourself honestly, employ the gifts that God has given you, and neither exaggerate nor minimize those gifts. If your gifts are lesser than someone else's, why does that bother you? Sound judgment mixed with a healthy dose of humility is the death of the sin of comparing. 
Okay, I need to be done in a couple of minutes here. Let me give you solution number eight. You can write down 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. Contentment. Right. Godliness of, is of great benefit, says Paul, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness is of great benefit when it's accompanied by contentment. When contentment is the hand that fills out the glove of your spirituality, of your Christianity, of your godliness, that is a great benefit. And then he goes on to talk about those who get into trouble because they're not content in their financial situation, and you could take finances out and put any other scenario in there that you wanted. Contentment is a vital part of godliness. Now, our last point will extend that. Turn to Colossians chapter 3 again, and we'll finish here. Colossians chapter 3. Because contentment is dominated by thanks, thankfulness. Contentment is something that is dominated by thanksgiving, by, by thankfulness, by that attitude. Colossians chapter 3 is one of the most important sanctification and godliness, daily Christian living passages in the entire New Testament. It highlights the put off, put on principle that we often talk about it. It tells us what we are to put on in Christ's likeness. Now, I want you to focus especially on verses 15, 16, and 17. See if you can pick up a repeated word or theme here. Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I think you saw it, didn't you? In one of the most important sanctification passages in the New Testament, the only word, it talks about humility and kindness and love and compassion and peace and all that, the only word that is repeated more than once, that is stated more than once, is the word thanksgiving. Now, I think I'm going to be, having, I'm going to be pushing a boulder uphill if I'm going to try to argue that thanksgiving is three times more important than love or humility or kindness, the other thing. But there's got to be a reason that Paul mentioned it three times, and if you read a few verses further on in chapter four, it's actually four times within a very short section. Paul is telling us that thankfulness is absolutely an essential ingredient to daily Christian living. And it is, not surprisingly, an essential ingredient to overcoming the sin of comparing. Because that contentment that we talked about in 1 Timothy 6 is then kept alive and energized by an attitude of daily thankfulness. So, daily moment-by-moment moment thoughts of gratitude and contentment gloriously replace and quench a fiery heart of comparing. So, after this morning, right? After this morning, comparing is now the worst and the most dangerous sin that you now have heard a sermon about, probably your first ever. I can't tell you how working on eradicating this sin from your mouth and from your mind will change your spiritual life. It'll puncture your self-righteous pride. It will transform your blended motivations It'll quell your temptations to bitterness. It'll rescue you from this sticky, sweet grip of self-pity. And it will release you from the web of, web of morose discouragement and frustration that perhaps you're living in. Daily putting to death the sin of comparing in your moment-by-moment -moment thinking will direct you to the freedom and the joy of serving Jesus Christ, to the liberating goal of advancing his name with no regard for your reputation. It will thrust you into a life of content thankfulness, gladly enjoying the gifts and the blessings that God has given you. That's not meaninglessness and frustration. That's the joy of Christ and the way we are meant to live. So, sin of comparing, the most dangerous sin that you now have heard a sermon about. Let's pray. 
Lord, this is a very important and powerful subject for us to deal with. You know, I, I laugh at myself, I, I mock myself as I preach this because I pat myself on the back because I'm the only preacher they've ever heard having preached against the sin of comparing how wonderful I am for it. It's just, it's just inescapable, Lord. We pray that you would open our eyes to the, to the, the sin of, of comparing in our hearts and our minds to its devastating effects and consequences. So many knock-on sins in our lives really come from this sin of comparing. Uh, I pray that this lovely, wonderful group of Christ-loving people this morning would have their eyes open and that they and I would see better um, this sin to be able to put it to death to be able to replace it. And we pray that we would live with that joyful thankfulness, doing what we do genuinely with unmixed motives as far as it's possible, right, to the glory of Jesus Christ. It's his name. It's his reputation. Killing us this sin of comparing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.